things. We're going to have fun in this, these 40 minutes here. Um, so, um, several years ago, I think it was 2008, I had debated Bart Ehrman that spring, and I had it on um, a DVD, and at the end of this course, I had our students watch this, and we dissected the debate, because I had taught them historical method and how to build a historical case for the resurrection of Jesus. And um, so they went through this and they saw how this could all work. And, but at the end of the class, I said, did this help you all? And they said, yeah, this was great. And this one girl said, well, um, I'm really troubled because um, Urban raised all these objections against the Gospels, of which contradictions in the Gospels is one of them. She said, you didn't address those in this. And I said, well, yeah, I didn't because I built my case for the resurrection using Paul's letters and the early oral tradition that's embedded in them, and that all predates the Gospels, and we don't even need the Gospels to build a historical case for the resurrection of Jesus. I said, you can do it, but that's not the approach I took, uh, because the truth of the matter is, if Jesus rose from the dead, and this is really important, if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, even if it were to turn out that some of the things in the Bible are not. Do you hear that? If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, even if it were to turn out that some of the things in the Bible were not. Now, I do believe the Bible is true. I believe it's all true, okay? I, I'm one of those guys who subscribe to the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. But what I'm saying is, if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, even if it turned out that some of the things in the Bible were not. So, I didn't want to focus on things like contradictions, because it's kind of a non-issue when it comes to the truth of Christianity. Nevertheless, it still bothers a lot of believers and shakes their faith. I had a pastor that was referred to me a few years back, and he was really struggling with his faith, and by the time we got put in in, in touch, he had just resigned his position as pastor of the church and walked away from his faith. I asked him why. Contradictions in the Gospels. We've got four Gospels here, and there are many differences. Well, I used to think that these could all be harmonized, no big deal, and think there weren't that many of them anyway. And then I decided five years ago, a little more than five years ago, that I would start reading through the Gospels exclusively in Greek. I would not use it in English anymore because well, I'm 52 right now. And I've been a Christian since the age of 10. And when you've been a Christian for about 40 years, you've read the Gospels so many times, you can mind kind of go on autopilot. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? A lot of you. Um, your mind goes on autopilot because you already know what it says. You're so familiar with it. So if I read it in Greek, I can't read Greek as well as I can read English, and it slows me down and it, con it calls me to concentrate on every verse, every phrase, every word. And when I did this, I started to notice differences like I never saw before. So I decided to start taking notes, and when I uh, started making notes of the differences, that document continued to grow and grow and grow, and now it's more than 60 pages. Six zero, more than 60 pages. So I look at these, I'm, so I'm familiar at this point with differences in the Gospels. I've been looking at it very carefully, very carefully for the last five years, a little more than five years. So then I got thinking, how can we account for these differences? Well, there are some of them that you can certainly harmonize, but others are very, very difficult, if not impossible. I suppose that you could really strain to kind of harmonize them, but then you kind of subject the text to a sort of hermeneutical waterboarding until they tell you what you want to hear. And I don't think that that really gives respect to the biblical text. So what do we do with these? I decided at that point what I was going to do, since the Gospels now for some time have been regarded as Greco-Roman biographies. Why not Jewish biographies? Because there were no Jewish biographies in that day. The closest we come is Philo's Life of Moses, and most scholars don't think that that is actually belongs to the genre of biography. So, if the disciples, or if the New Testament authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were going to write according to a genre of the day, Greco-Roman biography was the only game in town. <clears throat> now, a lot of work has been done on this. People like Richard Burridge, people like Craig Keener, David Hogg, and Charles Talbert have written on Greco-Roman biography. They talk about how 
it was a, a fluid, a, a fluid genre. There was flexibility in it, in the way that you told and retold stories. But rarely do these folks who are even experts in this area give example of how that's the case. So by comparing how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the stories differently, we can kind of speculate on, on some of this flexibility. But I thought I wanted to go a little bit further than this, because it's just speculation. But what if I could find ancient biographers outside of the Christian biographers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when writing biography, that I could see how they told and retold the story. So I made a list of all the different uh, biographers that wrote within, say, 150 years of Jesus on either side. They were just shy of 100. There's a guy named Plutarch who, during his lifetime, wrote over 60 biographies, and of these, 50 of them have survived. He wrote them as pairs. So, like he wrote Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, and then after that he'd write a comparison between the two and show parallels between them. So we have 50 of these, they're called Plutarch's Parallel Lives. Plutarch wrote at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. So he's writing contemporaneously with perhaps John, and he's writing in the same language, Greek. Now, here's what's really interesting about Plutarch. You can compare Plutarch with how Plutarch, Suetonius, and Tacitus tell the same story, such as the suicide of the Roman Emperor Otho in the year 69. And that tells us how three guys, ancient historians, told the same story but told it differently. What's interesting, too, you find that the differences that pop up there are the same kind of differences you find in the Gospels. But Plutarch gives us a unique opportunity. Because of those 50 biographies of his that have survived, nine of them involve people who lived at the same time and who knew one another. Caesar, Cicero, Pompey, Crassus, Cato the Younger, um, Antony, Brutus, they all lived at the same time, they all many of them participated in the same events. This means that Plutarch is going to end up telling the same story multiple times. So it's not different authors telling the same story and noticing the differences. It's how the same author told the same story and we still see differences. So he's dealing a lot with the same sources, so we wouldn't say he's contradicting himself. So I read through these several times, these nine biographies. They're called lives. They didn't use the term biography, then they used life, like the life of Caesar, the life of Cicero. And as I read through these, I started to notice that there are approximately 40 stories in those that appear two or more times. So by noticing how Plutarch tells these same stories and retells them, we notice these differences. As I go through them, I've noticed uh, patterns of the way he tells the stories differently, which tells me this is intentional in Plutarch's part. So I've found, to date, about eight compositional devices that Plutarch used to tell the story differently, and this resulted in differences in his biographies. Well, guess what? I go to these more than 60 pages of differences in the Gospels, I find now Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, ah, they're doing the same thing. These aren't contradictions. They're intentional. These differences appear for a reason. What I want to do in the next few moments is I want to uh, discuss three of these compositional devices with you. I wish I had time to go through eight of them. But I'm going to give you three of them. I'm going to show you these in Plutarch, and then I'm going to give you examples in the Gospels of these occurring. The first one is called compression. Compression is when an author knowingly portrays events over a shorter period of time than they had actually occurred. Now, let's look at an example in Plutarch. Julius Caesar has just put down numerous rebellions throughout the empire and has become a very powerful man. It's April of 56 BC, and Caesar has a meeting in a town called Lucca with Rome's two leading men, Pompey and Crassus. By the way, uh, you hear Pompeii. Pompeii is the city uh, that was destroyed by the volcano, where Pompey is the name of the person. So Pompey and Crassus are these two leading men in Rome, and they, they with Caesar, form an alliance. You see, then, um, like in American politics, we have the president. He's, he or she would be the, the top lead, the political position.
position in the land. Well, in ancient Rome, under the Roman Republic, you had what you were called consuls. And there were two consuls who served. They were the top positions. They served for one year, and they served together. And then they couldn't serve again for another 10 years. So Pompey and Crassus want to serve as co-consuls. And so they come to Julius Caesar, who's very uh, influential at this point. They say, we want you to help us to get elected. And Caesar says, well, I'll do that. But I want something in return. What do you want? I have a proconsulship right now in, in Gaul, present-day France. And I have a military command there. I want you to extend it. Once you're in office, I want you to extend it for five years. Done. So they just bump over this, and uh, they're good to go. So Caesar fulfills his promise, and he gets Pompey and Crassus elected as consuls. After they took office in January of 55 BC, the Tribune proposed a law assigning provinces to them for five years. Not Caesar, but the Pompey and Crassus for five years, instead of the typical one year. Now at that point, there's this astute Roman statesman named Cato, a guy with unswerving integrity and, and wants to look out for the Roman people. He jumps up and objects to it, and he objects so strenuously that the Tribune has him let off to prison. <laughs> the Senate then votes to go ahead and to ratify that law, and they give Caesar, uh, Pompey and Crassus their um, provinces for five years. Shortly thereafter, Pompey and Crassus set out to fulfill their end of the bargain and propose a second law. They had the Tribune propose a law that extends Caesar's proconsulship in Gaul for another five years. But at that point, Cato gets ticked off again, and he comes up, and he goes right to Pompey, and he says, you are raising a guy who ended up as your enemy, and you are really going to regret this. But they ignore it, and they get the law passed. Well, this story that I've just told you is told in three of Plutarch's lives. Again, I'm saying lives instead of biographies because that's the term they used back then. It's reported in Cato, Pompey, and Crassus. Now, in the life of Cato, uh, Plutarch provides the most detailed account by far because Cato was heavily involved in his opposition to both laws. And the details are relevant to Plutarch's life of Cato because they illustrate, in the process, they illustrate Cato's character, specifically his unswerving commitment to helping the people and integrity and to ridding Rome of internal corruption. But when Plutarch t tells the story in the life of Pompey and life of Crassus, both laws are portrayed as though passed as a single event. And the only mere mention is made of Cato. Why? It's not important to mention Cato, because the, here, in these lives, the emphasis or the focus is on Pompey, and the emphasis is on Crassus. So they don't really have to mention uh, Cato that much. But again, both laws are compressed or even conflated into one event, although it happens two separate events. And what about the Gospels? Do we find compression in the Gospels? Yes. In fact, there are three very clear examples of compression in the Gospels. The raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead, uh, the, the cursing of the fig tree, and uh, the third one would be oh, Jesus' resurrection and appearances and ascension in Luke's Gospel. Now, perhaps the very clearest of these is the story of Jesus raising Jairus' daughter. In Mark chapter 5, Jairus approaches Jesus and asks him to come heal his daughter, um, who is about to die. Now, Jesus agrees and they head toward Jairus' home. On the way, a woman with bleeding complications comes up, touches Jesus' uh, robe, and she's healed. Now, the, Jesus and Jairus head toward his home again, and all the way, some people from Jairus' house come up and they say to Jairus, uh, don't bother the teacher any longer, your daughter has just died. And Jesus says, don't worry about it, and they go on to Jairus' home, and Jesus raises her from the dead. Now, Matthew tells the story differently. In Matthew chapter 9, Jairus approaches Jesus and asks him to come and heal his daughter, who has just died. 
Jesus agrees to heal Jairus' daughter, and they head towards Jairus' home. Now on the way, a woman with bleeding complications touches Jesus, and she's healed. Then they proceed to Jairus' home, and Jesus raises his daughter from the dead. Now the question is, was Jairus' daughter dead or alive when Jairus came to him? As Bart Ehrman would say, it depends which gospel you read. Well, those who require our gospel text to, um, to read them in an inflexible or wooden sense are faced with a contradiction here. Now, I suppose you could go ahead and attempt to harmonize the accounts. Maybe you could say that there are two different events that are occur occurring here. Um, the first time, Jairus' daughter is still alive. Jesus heals her, and then she dies again. And so Jairus has to go back to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, it didn't hold. Uh, can you heal her again? At this time, can you make it last longer? And, and, but that only is the beginning of the complication because you got the woman with the bleeding complications. She has to come up a second time, so it didn't take for her at last either. Jesus was having an off day. <laughs> the good news is we don't have to resort to such desperate harmonization efforts in order to understand what's going on in the Gospels. If we recognize that Matthew is employing compression here, there are no adequate reasons for regarding this as a contradiction between the Gospels. Matthew simply changes the detail pertaining to the state of Jairus' daughter in order to abbreviate his account. And let me say, um, there, this is kind of like the difference between the way a guy tells the story and the way a girl tells the story, right? <laughs> You're married. Right, well, you know what I'm talking about, right? Ladies, girls like details. Lots of details. They want to know what happened, when it happened, why it happened, where it happened, who was there, what they were wearing, what they were thinking, what they said, and how they feel. <laughs> Those guys, we don't care about that. We don't care about all those details. We just want to give us the bottom line, give it to us in bullet points. Just get to, please, and the conclusion is what? You know, please give us in 30 seconds, which you guys will take 15 minutes to talk about amongst one another. You ladies can do that, but we just want it in 30 seconds sound like, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with the way an old lady tells the story. If I want to read a biography, a lot of times I'm going to want to hear the girl version of the story. But sometimes I want the guy version of the story. You know, I'm glad Matthew uh, tells the guy version a lot because he can get more stories in which Mark can't, because he's telling so many details. And I know that Mark would probably say to Matthew after reading his gospel, Matthew, you know it didn't happen that way. <laughs> Matthew says, shut up and back off, Mark. You remind me of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> the second compositional device is called transfer. Transferal is when an author knowingly attributes words or deeds to a person that he knew belonged to another. Let's return to Plutarch. Let's return to the same year, and let's return to the same event when Pompey and Crassus served as co-consuls and had those two walls passed. Now, in Plutarch's Life of Pompey and Life of Cato, Pompey and Crassus do this through the Tribune, who proposes the measures to the Senate. It beat today... Um, Forgive me for my ignorance. I am an American, so I am going to be ignorant uh, from the U.S. I know you guys are Americans too, so. Um, so, um, you know, we would use in American politics, the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the Senate would be the one that would introduce a bill. And so in the Roman Republic, you would have the Tribune who would do this. Um, so he proposes the measures to the Senate. However, in the life of Crassus, the Tribune isn't mentioned, and it's Pompey and Crassus themselves who have the measures passed. So in the life of Crassus, Plutarch has transferred the proposal from the Tribune to Pompey and Crassus. Now, if the event had been video recorded and we were viewing it, we would have seen the Tribune proposing the law, since that would have been his role. But because Pompey and Crassus were certainly behind this uh, proposal, Plutarch has them make the proposal and simply omits, brushes the Tribune out of the story. Now, transferal can often appear in the form of a substitution. In 53 BC, Rome was in a state of great turmoil and chaos. So the Senate appointed Pompey as sole consul for the year 52. So he would have uh, the sole power, you wouldn't have two, 
ruling together. During that year, Pompey reformed some laws, and one of the laws which it forbade reading an encomium favoring a defendant from being read during a trial. An encomium was like a speech that was giving praise to a person. And so like a defendant would be on trial and someone would come in and read this praise of how great this person was. Pompey said, no, you can't do that. That's not right to do in a trial. We're just going to look at evidence. We're not going to try to bias the jury on this. Now, Plutarch reports in two of his lives that Pompey broke his own law. And we know that he did break his own law. In Plutarch's life of Cato, Pompey writes an encomium and sends it to be read at the trial, but himself is not present. And we know that this is the way it went because other ancient historians, such as Valerius Maximus and Cassius Dio, they report the same thing. However, in Plutarch's life of Pompey, remember this is the same author writing at the same time, by the way. In the life of Pompey, Plutarch says that Pompey himself entered the court and pronounced the encomium. Awful. Well, did he send someone to say it? Or did he go himself? This is what's called transferal in the form of substitution. Now, you know what? We find the Gospels employing this transferal as well. I want to give you two examples. In Matthew, the mother of James and John approached Jesus with her two sons and requests that each of them sit on his right and left when he establishes his kingdom. However, in Mark, James and John come to Jesus and make the request while no mention is made of their mother. Now, since the story appears in the same context in both Gospels, it's without doubt the same story. It's the same event. Now, if the event had been video recorded, what would we have seen? Well, it's obvious that either Matthew or Mark has altered the details. If I were to guess, I'd say that Mark knew the mother had made the request, but he knew that ultimately James and John was behind it. They put their mom up to this. And so what does he do? He brushes the mother out of the text. He suppresses use of the mother there. She's out of the text. No mention is made of her. And he transfers the request from the mother to James and John, who were there anyway. Um, and they do this just as Pompey and Crassus were ultimately behind the laws proposed by the Tribune. An example of transfer on the Gospels in the form of substitution is the story of the centurion in Capernaum who asked Jesus to heal his male servant. In Luke chapter 7, the centurion sends some Jewish elders to make the request. Jesus agrees, and they begin their journey to the home of the centurion. But when the centurion learns that Jesus is approaching, he sends some friends to Jesus to communicate on his behalf that he's unworthy to have Jesus come under his roof, and that Jesus only needs to say the word, and his servant will be healed. So Jesus praises the centurion for his faith, and he heals his servant from a distance without ever having seen the centurion. Kind of reminds you of Pompey sending someone out there, right? to give the encomium, and Pompey himself doesn't show up. Now, when Matthew tells the same story in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion himself comes to Jesus and makes his request. Just like in the life of Pompey, Pompey himself goes and reads the encomium at the trial. So the centurion himself comes to Jesus and makes the request. Jesus heals the servant, Matthew compresses the story, while transferring the request to the mouth of the centurion. Um, uh, I think I missed, messed up something here, didn't I? Did I, I messed this up, didn't I? I'm losing track. Um, this means yes, this means no. <laughs> I mean, okay, so, all right, so in Luke's account, he sends some people, right? Never see. Okay, Matthew, the centurion himself goes. All right. So um, we see that this is what Jesus does here. He compresses the story. He transfers the request from the centurion to the Jewish elders in Matthew. Or you could say he transfers it, which is probably the case, back to the centurion himself. The centurion, in reality, probably never showed up. He sent someone. But Matthew compresses and transfers the story. A third compositional device is displacement. Displacement occurs 
when an author knowingly removes an event from its original context and transplants it in another. When an author knowingly removes an event from its original context and transplants it in another. Now, in his life of Caesar, Plutarch tells the story of a group of consuls, praetors, and senators that approach Caesar in order to honor him. When Caesar refuses to stand in respect, many leave in disapproval. Well, then Caesar comes to realize his gaffe, and so at that point he's embarrassed, and he pulls his toga back from his neck, exposing it, and invites anyone who wishes to strike him with a sword and kill him. All right? Now, later, uh, in February 44 BC, one month prior to Caesar's assassination, Caesar is seated at the Lupercalia festival when a number of men who had just completed the traditional race lift up Antony to Caesar, and Antony takes a laurel and tries to place it on Caesar's head. This would suggest that Caesar should be made king, a monarch, uh, and that the Roman Republic should be over at this point. Caesar should be the lone ruler. All right? At this point, there is some applause, but it's very light. So Caesar pushes the laurel away and rejects it being put on his head. At that point, the crowd erupts with robust applause. Antony, not to be put off, tries to put the laurel back on Caesar's head. Weak applause. So Caesar pushes it away and declines. Hearty applause. At that point, Caesar gets very upset and he leaves the event, walks away, because he wants to be monarch, he wants to be king. Now both of these events that I've just described to you are mentioned in Plutarch's life of Caesar. But in his life of Antony, Plutarch omits, omits the first event of the approaching political leaders, doesn't even talk about it, and he displaces, he dislocates Caesar's bearing of his neck and he transplants it to the later Lupercalia festival so that after Caesar pushes it away and there's hearty applause, at that point he pulls his toga back and invites anyone who wishes to strike and kill him. So he has displaced the event. He, he likes that story about pulling the toga back and offering his neck. He wants to include it and he doesn't care about the earlier event of Caesar not standing for the, the politicians coming to honor him. He wants to maintain the story, so he just takes it and he preserves it, but he puts it in a different context. This is displacement. Now, the Gospels often displace events. I find Luke probably doing it more than anyone else. Mary's anointing of Jesus with costly perfume before his crucifixion is reported by Matthew, Mark, and John. Matthew and Mark are clear that the event occurred two days prior to the Passover, whereas John says it was six days prior to the Passover. Now perhaps you can try to resolve this by saying there are two separate events here. I mean, after all, John is the only one that mentions that this is Mary, the sister of Martha and, and Lazarus, whereas she's anonymous in Matthew and Mark. So you say, well, maybe this is a different story. It's not a contradiction after all. However, there's some very strong reasons for regarding this as the same story. Let me give you a few. In all three accounts, the plot of the Jewish leaders to arrest Jesus immediately precedes the story of the woman anointing Jesus. In all three accounts, the, the anointing occurs in Bethany. In all three accounts, the woman pours costly perfume on Jesus. In all three accounts, the perfume is worth around 300 denarii. In all three accounts, one or more of those presents are indignant. And in all three accounts, Jesus' response is the same. He says, back off, dirtbags. What this woman did for me was very beautiful, and you always need to remember her, and the poor you're always going to have with you, but you're not always going to have me with you. These strongly suggest that John is referring to the same event as Matthew and Mark. But if he is, we have a contradiction. Was it two days or six days before the Passover? It depends which gospel you read, right? Well, this predicament is easily resolved if John is doing what Plutarch does on numerous occasions dislocating the event, removing it from its original context, and transplanting it in another. I would say, well, why would John want to do this? Well, for an answer, we're going to put a bookmark there for a moment, and I want to take you to two authors, one from the first century, one from the second century. The first century author is a guy named Theon, and he was an instructor in how to write literature, things like poetry, 
um, and uh, hymns, biography, history. We have what's called the Pragumasmata, and that he gives us six different means of paraphrasing. One of the things he says is that we should link our stories together in a narrative. Lucian, in the middle of the second century, uh, wrote one of the few very uh, surviving works from antiquity on how to write history. The title is How to Write History. <laughs> and in there, here's what Lucian says. He says, and I'll quote him, All the body of the history is simply a long narrative, so let it be adorned with the virtues proper to narrative, progressing smoothly, evenly, and consistently, neither more nor less than let its clarity blossom, as I've said, both by diction and the interweaving of the matter. For he will make everything distinct and complete, and when he has finished the first topic, he will introduce the second, fastened to it, and linked with it like a chain to avoid breaks and a multiplicity of disjointed narratives. No, always the first and second topics must not merely be neighbors, but have common matter and overlap. This is how to write history in antiquity. So we have to ask, can we see a link, some overlap present in the story of Mary anointing Jesus? Thanks for asking that question, Dan. That's a very good question. Matthew and Mark's account of the anointing is the only appearance of this Mary in their Gospels. And she's not mentioned by name in either. However, in John's Gospel, you know what happens right before this story of a, a woman anointing Jesus? In the previous chapter, it's Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And who else is in that story? Mary and Martha. So could it be that John here says, you know what, I just told the story about Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and while I'm at it, hmm, I've got another story I could tell about Mary. Mary's the overlap, and so he does. Mary is the overlapping material. And so he dislocates the story from two days prior to Passover, backs it up to six days, so he can link it together with the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now, would I feel a little more comfortable if John had, had just done that and didn't say six days prior to Passover? Yeah. Why he had to put that six? I don't know. But, I mean, he's just going by ancient historiography, how to, to write the past. And uh, some of us may not feel comfortable with how the ancients did this, but I suspect both Theon and Lucian would have smiled with approval at what John did. Let's look at another example of displacement. Matthew, Mark, and Luke report the story of Jesus' disciples arguing among themselves about which of them is the greatest. So Jesus sets a child before them, and school begins. The lesson to be learned is the one who desires to be great must be humble as a child, and you better not cause one of these little ones to stumble, or you're going to be in deep kimchi. The Gospels include other teachings within this context in which the story appears. Temptations will come, Jesus says, but woe to the person who tempts. If a body part causes you to sin, rip it out or cut it off. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him, even if he sins and repents many times. Now, of the three Gospels that report this story, Matthew has the, provides the fullest version. All these teachings that I've just uh, mentioned right here. Now, Luke provides almost as much. However, he, in, in Luke chapter 9, however, he displaces portions of the story to a different context. Luke 9 reports their argument about who is greatest, and Jesus places a child before them and tells them that they receive the child in his name, they receive him and the Father, and the least among them is the greatest. But then Luke displaces the remainder of the story eight chapters later in Luke chapter 17. Temptations will come, Jesus says, but woe to the person who tempts. That's just from the same passage in Matthew, right? Where it's all lumped together? It would be better for him for the person who tempts, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Excuse me, what little ones? There's no little ones in this text. This is chapter 17. Well, what about chapter 6? No, there's no little ones in chapter 16. There's, you don't even find the little ones show up again until the middle of chapter 18. So, Luke's original readers, they're reading this. And they're thinking, what little ones? They don't have Matthew before. 
What little ones are you talking about, Luke? Those familiar, like we are with the story in Matthew and Mark, will know Luke is referring to the children Jesus referred to when he stood a child before them in chapter 9. The first readers of Luke probably didn't have these other Gospels, so they may have thought, you know, what little ones are we talking about here? Luke has displaced the story from its original context and transplanted that at a later time within his narrative. Now, in some cases, we could say, well, maybe they're just, Jesus told the same story on two or more occasions, and that's certainly possible, but that won't work here because the mention of those little ones. Luke did what we also saw done by John, and we see done on many occasions in Plutarch. He has displaced part or even all of the story and relocated into a different context. And it's this case of Luke's mentioning these little ones. This is what scholars refer to as editorial fatigue. Luke could have brushed the text up a little and read it a little more carefully and said, hey, this doesn't really fit here. I need to kind of clean this up a little bit. But he doesn't do this. And because of this, we like this as historians because we can see that this is exactly what Luke has done. He has performed displacement. Now, before we leave the story, I want to make another observation, a very brief one. After Jesus' disciples had been arguing with one another about which of them is the greatest, Mark's account says that Jesus asked them, what have you been discussing amongst yourselves? Well, they're kind of embarrassed, and so they're quiet. They don't answer Jesus. But in Matthew's account, it's the disciples who come to Jesus and ask him, hey, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What's, well, did Jesus ask them, or did they ask Jesus? Well, one of these guys has employed transferal, hasn't he? So, we've seen that both Plutarch and the Gospel authors use compression, transferal, and displacement when telling and retelling stories, and that these can account for numerous differences in the Gospels. Like I said, I've, I've been able to identify eight compositional devices at this point. I've only been able to discuss three with you, but I'm getting close to being out of time. So, let's just touch very briefly on one more topic. Historical reliability. What does this do to the issue of the historical reliability of the Gospels? Can we still regard them as historically reliable? I think we've got to take genre into consideration. Literary type, literary style. Now, since God doesn't all actually sleep, is it an error when the psalmist writes, Awake, oh, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Well, of course not. Because we know that when we read Psalms, there's some poetic element to it, and the psalmist didn't intend for that element to be understood in a literal manner. I think the same could be said about a lot in the book of Revelation. What about Jesus' parables? Genre. Parables are not intended to reflect historical events. So when you reach the parable of the prodigal son, um, I, I don't expect that, there, that that story actually occurred. Jesus invents that story. It's a parable. And he invents that story in order to communicate a principle. Well, what about the Gospels? Well, Gospels were biographies, lives, and these were meant to communicate historical recollections of what actually occurred. But just as guys tell the story differently than, than girls, ancient biographers had a flexibility available to them that we see Plutarch doing, that we've seen the Gospel authors doing, and by employing those devices, sometimes differences uh, occur. So did God lie when he inspired the psalmist to say God was sleeping? Did Jesus lie when telling the parable of the Good Samaritan, although he knew the Good Samaritan probably never existed? No. Not if there weren't, these weren't intended to be understood in that sense. So when Matthew says that the centurion showed up and asked Jesus to, to heal a servant, was that a lie? I don't think so. Not if he's using a commonly employed biographical device that ancient biographers would do. We've got to keep in mind that they are ancient biographies. We have to judge them according to the literary conventions of their day and how they follow them rather than import our ideas of modern precision upon them. I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not form this committee for the misleading of future historians. They operated by the laws of their day. 
Uh, today, professional photographers alter photographs in order to emphasize an element that may not be so apparent. So maybe think of, imagine a, a photograph of a couple walking through a meadow holding hands on a sunny day. And uh, the photographer takes that picture, takes it back, puts it in Photoshop, and casts a slight haze over the, the flowers in the meadow. While we look at that, we say, hey, was the sky really that blue? No. Was there really a haze over the meadow that day? No. But no one objects to these artistic, minor artistic alterations in order to emphasize the romantic element. It's okay to do that as long as you don't distort the photograph to um, portray that couple in a manner that was contrary to the way it actually was, right? Like they were fighting or breaking up rather than, you know, um, or, you know, pulling away from each other, something like that. Or a storm outside. That would be to distort it. But if you make an, a minor alteration in order to emphasize an element, that would be okay. We don't have problems with that. Well, if we truly have a high view of the Bible, we must submit ourselves to the Gospels as God has designed them and has given them to us, rather than squeeze the Gospels to fit within a view of how we think God should have written them. And in conclusion, I'd just say that amateur photography is my hobby. I, you know, I love the challenge of getting a, a good shot. The last time I was here a year ago, uh, Greg took me out. I had such a, a great time with this couple last time, and, and, and maybe some of you, we, we were with Dale Martin, too. We had a good time with him. And, um, you know, I took a lot of pictures when we were at Peggy's Cove, didn't I? I mean, that was just amazing. I had it on my desktop for a while. It's just an amazing place. Um, I love the challenge of getting a good shot. But it's really frustrating when I can frame the picture well, set the white balance and the aperture setting and all this, and I take the picture and I look at it and, ah, it's just slightly out of focus. I miss the shot. Well, same thing can happen when we're studying the Bible. We love to read stories of Jesus. But sometimes, when we're reading these stories of Jesus, we get flustered and bent out of shape when all the details don't perfectly align. Instead of losing faith in the historical reliability of the Gospels, instead we need to step back and consider the possibility that our hermeneutical approach is to all of us to miss the shot. Thanks much.